Hi, everyone. I'm Ed Baker, and I'm your host producer here at the Addiction Recovery Channel at Town Meeting TV. I couldn't be more excited today. We have two uh, incredibly interesting and talented, committed guests. We have Jim Raw, and we have Ronette Leave. <clears throat> Thank you so much you for, for being with us. Um, Jim Raw is the founder of Families Against Fentanyl. He's a powerful leader and advocate. He's involved on many levels of activity and advocacy. He's currently lobbying the U.S. Congress to declare fentanyl and its many analogs a weapon of mass destruction, and rightfully so. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for your work. Thank you for having me on. We also have Ranit Lev, MD. She's a board-certified in emergency and addiction medicine. Ranit is the current executive director of the Independent Emergency Physicians Consortium, and she was the first chief medical officer at the White House uh, Office uh, on uh, National Drug Control. That's quite a distinction. Congratulations, Rene. Thank you. Pleasure to join you. Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Lev is an energetic leader with a passion to assist communities in preventing and treating addiction. She hosts the podcast High Truths on Drugs and Addiction which I've watched a number of times and is an excellent, an excellent podcast. I'd like to just kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about today. In the 12-month period ending October 2021 in America, there have been at least, I mean, the, the official estimate is 105,672 deaths to drug overdose. Now, this, the, the great majority of these deaths involves fentanyl. The remainder in involve, uh, for the most part, methamphetamine and other stimulants. Um, this is a, a truly like a, a, an unprecedented American tragedy. It could not be more urgent. I want to congratulate you and I want to thank you both for your work to do something about this, your tireless work to do something about this. And I want to begin with uh, getting to know you. I would like my audience to get to know you a little bit. So, Jim. Why don't you start? Can you tell us a little bit about what it was that got you involved in this, this commitment, got you involved in your mission to do something about this? Um, my son was killed uh, with uh, fentanyl poisoning in 2015. He was given a uh, dose of pure acetyl fentanyl that would have killed hundreds of men um, without his knowledge, thinking that he was going to receive some heroin. Um, it killed him instantly. Uh, after that, when the uh, coroner told me the type of material, I was stunned. I had, uh, began to investigate what this material was. Then uh, the Justice Department followed up and um, did the f unbelievable amount of work to trace that poisoning all the way back to China mm -hmm. and the Zhang drug trafficking organization that supplied the material and indicted the Chinese nationals for the murder of my son and went over to China and prosecuted, prosecuted them. Mm -hmm. um, they were uh, subsequently let go and uh, our uh, prosecutors came back from the Justice Department empty handed and uh, that got me engaged in the situation. Understood. Understood. And I can see as a father myself, I can see how justice was not done. And it's your mission to bring justice to that international drug cartel. And, uh, and I respect that. And I will help you in any way I can to do that, uh, Jim. I read about Tommy in um, Sam Kinones's book, uh, The Least of Us. I read about him, a Viking of a son long yellow ponytail, the oldest of your five, wasn't he? He was the oldest of uh, my five children, the leader of uh, his little uh, group of uh, followers, and uh, he had followers everywhere that he went. He was a very dynamic and uh, energetic young man, uh, very creative. You know, you know, because I'm involved in the field and I care deeply, um, I sometimes, I can feel it. I can, I can feel the grief, and sometimes I, I think about it, and I think about, you know, how unspeakable it is, and, and to try to magnify it 
to multiply it by 105,672 for 2021. It's, it's just, it's almost hard to conceptualize the emotion that this country is containing as a result of, 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 of fentanyl and what's happening. It's just incredible. It's, it's horrific. It, this happened in 2015. And the, the Zengs were indicted in uh, China. They, they prosecuted them, and then the, the Chinese government let them go. Yeah. After after they had all of this proof, and they've continued to kill ever since. At the time of that indictment was written, they purportedly were making 16 metric tons a month of fentanyl. And you can you can see that you can see that in what's happening in America today. And we'll get to that in a little while. The DEA warning. On, on mass overdose incidents, the level of fentanyl contaminating the drug supply, we're going we're gonna to get to that. But first, uh, Ranit, so welcome to the show, Dr. Thank Lev, you. Ranit. What, what, what got you, what was it that, that pulled you into this, you know, pulled you into this area? What was it that attracted you or compelled you to dedicate yourself to this? So I, I wanted to be a doctor since I was uh, in eighth grade, I just wanted to, you know, help people, make the world better, and I uh, became an emergency physician. And early in my career, I was a follower. Right? He said that we knew we have to follow the pain scale. Uh, we're not. I was told we're not giving enough opioids as an emergency physician. I was criticized for my profession of not treating pain adequately, until I met parent victims. Um, whose children died of prescriptions that I could have written. And um, I studied that um, when that was brought to my attention. I said, that couldn't be. How could you know? My job is to help people. The worst possible thing a doctor, an emergency physician can ever find out. Like people always say, oh, as an ER doctor, what's the worst case you've ever seen? The worst case is learning that you screwed up. Mm. So, and I think our profession itself uh, made a mistake. Um, and I learned that from these parent victims and became an advocate in the medical profession in improving um, our opioid prescribing and safe prescribing. And um, that um, led me to the, um, becoming an addiction specialist as well. That, 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 is, uh, that is refreshing to me to hear you say that because I, I do reflect on that. At times, you know, I think the American Medical Association, or I know that that the president actually apologized, public apology, uh, public, public apology. I forget what year it was, and um, accepted some responsibility as a profession for contributing to the opioid crisis that we see in America today. But I, I always felt that that was a little shy of really what had what should have been done. And, um, you know, like perhaps uh, medical doctors prescribing opioids during that period would, would, would voluntarily contribute a certain number of thousands of dollars each to combating the opioid crisis in America. That somehow there would be kind of like an acceptance of responsibility and then like an act of amends made. To the American population, and um, I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening. Um, but but I see people like you, and I know others like you, individuals, who are not afraid to accept some kind of responsibility and do something about it. So I wanna, I wanna thank I, you. I I do want to defend my profession because I don't. I think you know, doctors go through a lot of uh, heartache to become doctors. Nobody mm. means to. Like I said, the worst thing ever is to, to find out that you hurt someone with your medical care. And, um, but we're just human, right? So we follow whatever we're told to do. When people think that, you know, doctors you know, should know better, but we didn't. I didn't know better. I was following what I was taught. I was following the, the laws that were passed. Um, at the time. So I, I actually think that I've done amends I, and I continue to do amends to this day. And, and um, what happened with the opioid prescription epidemic is it brought the medical community into the equation while addiction was this very stigmatized problem. 
because we became part of the problem, we also became part of the solution. And the people I haven't seen make amends and say that they are the people who passed the laws, um, which are still on the books today that created the problem in the first place. What laws are you referring to? <clears throat> um, a patient bill of right laws, uh, pain as a right law in California, uh, six, 12 hours of education just on pain. These are all still um, on the books in California. Um, they're still in order to get your license renewed throughout uh, America. You need to take pain education. So they, you know, we add laws, but we rarely take them away. So the bad laws are still there. You know, it seems, I mean, talking along these lines about responsibility and amends, it seems like the, the, like the, the Sackler family, uh, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, some of the opioid um, uh, wholesale distributors, they have, they've all been held to account, and they are, you know, uh, being forced uh, to pay sizable amounts of money to do something about the crisis that, that they created. I would just like to see that go a little further. And um, I had a conversation with Sam Quinones about it, uh, holding China and Mexico, you know, responsible for their international crime organizations and governments that allow these things to happen, to find a way to hold them responsible. And he, he, um, he, 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 he reflected on it a little bit and said that seven years ago, if, if anybody would have said that a group of attorneys general in America could band together and create class action suits and hold the Sackler family responsible, people would have said, that's impossible. These people have so much money that they're untouchable. You'll never get to them. But we did, we did get to them. So I'm thinking that in the future, maybe um, uh, initiatives such as Jim's to get at some of these countries that are housing uh, international crime organizations um, Will, will prove successful. I certainly hope so. I'd like to go from here. Uh, Renee, specifically, I'd like you to talk a little bit because we're going to talk about fentanyl a lot, and I know you're a scientist and a medical doctor. So let, help my, my audience to understand. We've had heroin. In fact, Jim's son, Jim, your son, was using opioids for 10 years when fentanyl came. It changed the game. It was deadly, a killer. What is it about fentanyl that's different than heroin, that's different than oxycodone? What, what is it? What makes it such a, I think Sam Quinones calls it a fanged drug. Unbelievable potency, just unbelievable potency. Um, fentanyl in itself is uh, 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine, and then you have uh, analogs of fentanyl, acetyl fentanyl, acryl fentanyl, car fentanyl is 100 times stronger than fentanyl. So you, you're getting killed by micrograms. And so, you know, we have a material that's uh, more deadly than uh, plutonium. Mm. In, yeah. Uh, mind in boggling. Mind boggling. Form. Yeah, mind boggling so in some ways. Opioids are. Um, act in the same part of the brain. And Jim is absolutely right. It's all a matter of dosing, right? So, um, you know, hydrocodone, oxycodone, heroin, fentanyl, they all work on the same receptors of the brain. They're the same class of medicine um, or drug, and they work on the opioid receptors of the brain. And deep with enough dosing, they stop your breathing. And that's how people die. They just stop breathing and then go into a cardiac arrest. Right, but taking a little bit can relieve pain. Um, taking too much and you die instantly, which is what happened to Tommy. So it's all a matter of dosing and just a little bit of, of, of you know, as they say, two grains of salt of pure fentanyl can, can kill you. And it's very easy to produce. Um, so we have a lot more of supply. Um, so we got, you know, the dosing, the potency, the increased supply, and that's why we have like an, an airplane a day falling out of the sky of people from using fentanyl every day in the United States, really a tragedy. And an airplane a day falling out of the sky. Now that, that is something to, to create urgency. I reflect on it, and it was, it was 105,000 deaths, so it was the equivalent of 35 World Trade Centers in, in one year. 
Um, I also understand about fentanyl that it has a very quick onset. That's one of the reasons why it's such a valuable medical painkiller, because the onset, it gets into the mu receptors really quickly and binds very strongly. And when you combine that with, with potency, when people inject it especially, there's like instant overdose. And if there's not someone around to administer Narcan, that person is, is uh, sure to die. Is that the case? Well, I, I, it's still the same type of receptor. Um, we have to be careful not creating um, panic for rescue. You know, you're not going to, you know, there, there is some misinformation. You're not going to just touch it and, and die. You have to get it into the body by smoking it or injecting it. And it's the amount, it's the, the, the quantity and the potency, which can be in a small little amount that, that, that kills you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, uh, Jim? I would, I would compare it with um, ether. In, uh, in the old days, they would take a little dab of ether, you know, the first anesthetic, put it on a cloth and put it on over your face, face and you'd pass out almost immediately. Very fast onset, very, very quick to be knocked out. This is, this is reacts very quickly along the same lines. It, it, it immediately cuts off pain and you have a very quick onset, very, and it's related to the same chemical. Yeah, you know, and... Uh, and by the and way, uh, Jim is a chemist. Um, I know, in, in his yes. profession, so um, not, not just a victim, but also knowledgeable in, in the science. I understand that. So, Rene, tell us a little bit about... I know you're on the front lines. You're in the emergency room. What are you seeing in the emergency room where you are? Um, we're seeing um, regular exposures to fentanyl. Um, I just before this call saw um, data from our children's hospital with an alarming rise of babies um, under the age of five being exposed to fentanyl because their parents are using, their kids are, are, are using. And so we had a presentation where back in 2019, there may be been three cases total in San Diego County. And now in 2021, there have been 40 oh. babies under the age of five being wow. exposed to fentanyl. Um, so I just saw that, that just devastating. Um, and uh, because it's aerosolized for them, for these little babies, they can get exposed um, as well. In the emergency department where I work, um, there's good news too. It's not all bad news. We see a lot of people coming in saying, I'm addicted to um, fentanyl and I need help. Um, and we are able to provide buprenorphine and connect them to treatment, give them naloxone. Um, talk about their addiction. And so there's uh, good news happening as well. I like the fact that people are open um, with their addiction and therefore they're, they're, you know, we can create um, treatment connections for them. And tragically, we see people die. Um, um, if, if they're lucky to get into the emergency department, you know, there's, there's a, a, a bell-shaped curve of whether you get naloxone early on in an overdose and reverse everything and you're, you're fine and you go home. Um, or um, being dead, and I don't see them in that sense. They go to the medical examiner, or in between, you're, you're on the ventilator or have lung damage. Um, that's really why anybody who suffers any overdose and you use naloxone, you have to call 911 because you don't really know how much damage has, has happened. Yeah, I think that's an important point for the audience to hear, that, that if you administer naloxone to someone who's overdosed, call 911 and get them there because there may be additional medical care that's necessary. In Vermont, we have what's called Good Samaritan Laws, where you, you, you know, you, you can be at a scene where there's paraphernalia and there's drugs. You can call emergency workers and they can come and you're not going to be uh, accused of a crime. Nothing's going to happen to you. In fact, we, you should be thanked for calling some, uh, for getting the right kind of personnel involved and maybe saving, maybe saving a life. <clears throat> So you're on the front lines and you see it. That, I didn't know that about uh, children under five, that there had been um, additional uh, e exposure. That's, that's new in information for me and certainly something to be very concerned about. You know, Jim, I think that part of your research, weren't, didn't you come up with the, the statistic that fentanyl is the number one killer of Americans between the age of 18 and 45? Wasn't that you? Y yes, our, our team uh, combed through the 
CDC data, after uh, looking at news stories for quite a long time, we conjectured that uh, this was impacting a demographic of people. We confirmed that by pouring through the CDC data and we discovered that it's the number one killer of Americans between the ages of 18 and 45. And that demographic is widening. It appears that it's now moved to uh, 13 to 50, but we're having trouble getting real-time data. We're, we're uh, approaching the CDC, asking them to give us more granular data. Um, Ronit is right. We're seeing babies being killed weekly. A, a year ago, I had seen maybe one or two in the whole year that were made the news, but now I'm seeing them almost on a weekly basis of, babe, of children under five dying through incidental contact. And, and this is a uh, indicative of, of uh, you know, the prevalence of the material in our society. That, that we're being flooded with this material and it's, it's killing the innocent by incidental contact. You know, this is really um, something, and I, I, I mean, if you pay attention to the data, and you look at the, the trend o over time, you, you see this incredible, uh, it's like an escalation of uh, velocity. You see the velocity of these incidents not only increasing, but, 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 but more quickly o over it, time, over the past 10 yes. years. And it's, this doubled is, in, it's doubled in the United States in the last two years. Yeah. That's an incredible problem. Yeah. And, it's tripled in teen deaths and maybe more. It's up five times in black American deaths. It's targeting the black American communities. Um, this is showing epidemiological uh, growth that's extremely alarming. And beyond that, the uh, seizures that are showing are coming in are more than all of the uh, addicts could use in the history of addiction. That, that, that we're being flooded at, with an amount that's um, unbelievable, just unbelievable. And really kudos to Jim and um, his research team at, at Families Against Fentanyl for taking the data that the CDC has, but compiling it in a way that the public could understand and showing you that more people die from fentanyl than from COVID. Because the last couple of years, that's all we heard about is COVID, yeah. COVID, COVID. Yeah. And I always say I'm jealous of infectious disease because we should be talking about fentanyl, fentanyl, fentanyl. Well, you know, that's, that's interesting that you mention infectious disease because I, I think I remember one of my conversations with you saying that we should apply an infectious disease model to the fentanyl epidemic. Do you want to talk about some of the ways that we might do that, some of the ways that might help us to do something about what's going on on the street? Yeah, so I, I've always been jealous for infectious disease because they, they get a lot of the attention, they get a lot of resources from public health. It started even before the pandemic when we talked about, you know, I know what zip code we have more gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, is, and we give partner treatment to those uh, in, uh, infectious diseases. And we sent alerts and bulletins to the medical community about, you know, tuberculosis or salmonella, but we don't do that for for overdoses. Um, so number one is mapping. Those infectious diseases have mapping. We have mapping for COVID. We should have mapping um, universally for overdoses, for whatever the, the drugs is, because you can't tackle a problem without that data. So that's number one. Number two, we do we know about contact tracing for COVID, right? You know, uh, I don't know how effective that has been, but we, we do that. And we also know that for every person, we're seeing that with every person who overdoses, there's other people at risk, other children at risk, other family members, uh, other friends at risk. And so that's a time of, of intervention. So I would take every overdose and make that into a contact tracing moment to see who else is at risk and what prevention can be done um, at, at that moment. And those are the kind of, of uh, and eradication. So what, what uh, you know, we had to drain the swamps to get rid of malaria, right? Or, or we had vaccination programs for polio. We can apply those principles to infectious diseases, right? We can eradicate these precursors, which is what Families Against Fentanyl is trying to do. And that's the ultimate, um, I think, so solution. 
um, at that level. And in the meantime, you know, deploy treatment, deploy primary prevention, um, uh, do contact tracing, the same kind of models we've done, you know, for COVID and other infectious diseases that we apply to, to uh, issue of drugs. That, that is fascinating to me, and I, I certainly hope that that, that kind of a approach uh, gains in popularity and gains in support. So we, we have a lot of um, attention on, on the, the micro level, which is, you know, good. We have Narcan, we have buprenorphine, we have methadone, we have treatment, we have residential, you know, in hospital, outpatient. In Vermont, we have a, a system of hub and spoke where we have, we have a lot of buprenorphine uh, being utilized in Vermont. We have low access to buprenorphine. We have good harm reduction here. We have harm reduction centers that will, um, you know, uh, provide fentanyl testing strips, our Narcan, uh, a wound reduction kits, all kinds of education. I mean, we're doing, we're doing, you know, we have a robust response here in Vermont on that, on the micro, on the micro level. And uh, different states have different levels of that. We're, we're doing pretty well. We, 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 the, the, the literature and the conversation has been on that. We, we, you know, part of what you hear is there'll always be a supply as long as there's a demand. So we need to work on the demand side, work on people with addiction, educate kids so our next generation doesn't want drugs. This is all well and good. But what's happened with fentanyl, it's a game changer. It's changed it. It's so urgent now because we have so many people dying that I, I, I'd like Jim to focus on this activity not on the demand side, but activity on, directly on the supply side, directly on where these drugs are coming from and how they're coming into uh, America. What is it? What is it that your your experiences? How are you being guided by your experience specifically in regard to that, Jim? The the Council on Combating Synthetic Opioids uh, just convened and, and gave their report. Um, it's a bipartisan group that uh, of senators and luminaries, military people, Admiral Winnefeld, uh, various people are, are on it. Uh, they concluded that. Um, this is a uh, travesty. This, this is a purposeful poisoning of the American public that's being done with malice. It's a slow motion weapon of mass destruction in pill form. Um, this material is being, uh, the precursors are being made primarily in China, shipped to uh, various ports in Mexico where they're being protected and brought into uh, very, uh, now very large, uh, relatively manufacturing uh, facilities run by the cartels along with, um, I believe, uh, the Zhang Drug Trafficking Organization along with several other Chinese nationals that are down there cooperating with this. They're manufacturing this in uh, mass quantities shipping it into the United States in quantities that are indicative of stockpiling. Now, according to the, according to the council, the, the total demand in the United States should be no more than 3,000 pounds of, of, uh, of fentanyl would, would uh, supply the whole country for a year. They've seized tens of thousands of pounds of fentanyl enough to kill the country several times over. In Riverside, California this year, they found 21 kilograms of carfentanil, which is listed uh, by the um, OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, as a weapon of mass destruction. They found 21 kilograms of pure carfentanil in Riverside, California. Yeah. Now, this is indicative of stockpiling. The material is not only being distributed in a slow motion weapon of mass destruction to our, to the uh, public from school children all the way through to the addicted to it is now present in a way that threatens our national security. 
This material can be distributed or dispersed in mass casualty events, which is starting to show up in these fentanyl poisonings. And under the under just straight physics, distribution goes to, to dispersion no matter what through entropy. But now it's starting to be done on purpose and it's going to start showing up in these, as the, as the DEA has said, they're starting to have these clusters of, of little mass casualty events. And according to epidemiology, this should turn into something far, far worse. We're trying to get in front of that by declaring it a weapon of mass destruction and using every amount of our governmental power to stop this before this worst case scenario takes hold. Let, let me let me ask you a, a question, and that was uh, that's a beautiful um, description of 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 a reality that a lot of people have not seen yet. There seems to be a reluctance to see that, a reluctance to see the magnitude of what is going on. the The Addiction Recovery Channel has always been focused on deconstructing stigma. It's our feeling here that stigma is one of the main blockers of making progress in this area. And I, I would like to know, do you, do you see that? Do you see that people being a little bit reluctant to move forward because of this feeling that, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's addicts. You know, it's like, it's not the general public. You know, it's, it's addicts. You know, like, it's they not, see, it's not they that see them important. As culpable. They see them as culpable in their own deaths. They look down upon them. They're sh and the people who are you know, ashamed of them. They're ashamed of, of themselves for letting, for you know, having an addict in the family. They weren't a good parent. They didn't look after their kids. They, you know, they feel this uh, guilt, you know, for letting this happen. Um, it's it's buried underneath all this uh, quiet. You know, when a plane goes down or all this tragedy happens, there's explosions and buildings are knocked over and there's drama. This is quiet body bags being picked up in the dark and somebody taken away to the morgue where the, somebody may or may not claim them. You know, and it's one after another, after another, another heartbreak that adds up to this horrible grief in the United States. It's just draining the life out of us. But is it, isn't, isn't, it, isn't that what we as a culture, um, you know, that we need to face, isn't it? In with people like you, people like Ranit, the the Addiction Recovery Channel, so many thousands of us today, and more and more of us, our voice is becoming stronger and stronger. Our voice is becoming louder and louder. There are groups rising up, saying, "Wait a minute, wait a minute, we've had enough." People to people, I know someone who died. I know someone who may die tomorrow. We have to do more about this. You know, I, that's what I love about you, Jim. I love about you that, that you're not afraid of urgency, that somehow, you know, um, being callous and insensitive and cool about things doesn't appeal to you. You know what urgency means. And it's, it's, I think there's a failure in America to embrace urgency. Somehow we're afraid of it. We're afraid to embrace what's really happening. And as long as we assume this position, it will keep getting worse. It will keep getting worse. So I, I couldn't um, agree, with you, agree with you more. It's been hidden, but we're beginning, we're beginning more and more to talk about it, to face it, and to feel it, like you just felt it, and like I feel it too. And I'm sure you do also, Renee. I think we should highlight the positive here because it's so grim. Um, because we we make improvements and then we forget about them and focus on the bad. Mm. Um, so we we have come a long way. Uh, we're not where we should be. We could always improve. But I, I think several things has happened. One is like I mentioned, the the medical community is now at the table, um, uh, dealing with the issue of of addiction, and, and um, so I think that that's a positive. Number two. It's a positive and a negative at the same time. Probably every family in America has been affected, <clears throat> right? So everybody knows somebody um, who has an addiction or who has died. And that's the sad part of it. But the positive part of it is that the issue of stigma, um, it, it's allowed people to speak up. Um, and I just want to mention a little bit about stigma. 
we have to really focus, I, I do a whole course on eliminating stigma with clinical understanding. Mm. Um, and, and that means if you understand the biology of addiction, then you understand that it's a chronic relapsing disease. It has relapse rate, mm -hmm. just like asthma or hypertension or diabetes has. It affects certain parts and chemicals of the brain. And then you treat it as you would any other medical uh, disease with the same type of compassion. On the other hand, uh, I don't want to normalize drug use. I don't think that that's okay. We have to deal with primary prevention and there should be stigma on the product at least, right? Well, we don't want people to be using fentanyl. We don't want people to be um, uh, getting addicted to drugs in the first place, right? Stigma, uh, you know, helps us stop smoking. You know, like, oh, we don't want to be smoking. Now, if you, if you have addicted addiction to nicotine, you're a smoker, I mean, you're, you know, it's still part of the family. You just maybe ask to smoke in a different part, room or outside the house. And um, so I just have to be, we have to be careful when we talk about stigma. We still want it as a, 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 in a prevention, primary, especially primary prevention tool, yeah. um, but, but compassion to the person who has Abs the, absolutely. The when I and when I talk about stigma, I'm talking about the war on drugs, punishing, holding people, you know, making them feel ashamed, like they're bad, wrong, immoral, just looking for pleasure. We need to punish. We may we need to make it so uncomfortable for you that you're going to stop taking drugs, you know. And that just doesn't really work. We want to like embrace people with love and help them to, you know maybe use less drugs and maybe eventually if they want stop using drugs but to make them feel uh, you know accepted and supported rather than um you know pariahs and people who are are persecuted and it you know that still is happening in, in America to a great deal i mean i agree with you there's been national movements statewide movements local movements we're changing our language you know and everybody seems to be really catching on to that but I agree with you also that you have to understand the clinical ways that addiction works because just changing our language is one thing, but we need to have understanding down inside in our hearts because that's what people with addiction feel. You can use the right language but be housing stigma and they will feel it and they will not come back. But if you're using the right language and you're housing love and acceptance, they'll feel that and they will come back. And um, I know you know that because you're a professional uh, in the field. And um, I couldn't agree with you more. I feel really encouraged about what's going on in my country. But um, I just think we need, to, we need to push. We need to push now. And um, because like, like, as Jim is saying, it's just, it's, 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 it's overwhelming what's going on. Jim? Mm -hmm. Alcohol and drug addiction, uh are hereditary mm. you know runs in families degree. yeah people have people have a weakness to them and and you know this has been uh taken advantage of mm. the opium wars were waged against china and china is reversing the opium wars on us the, mm -hmm. it, it's they know they know what our weakness is and they've found a material that makes heroin uh, this addicts you so much more quickly than heroin the 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 ability to break down a amygdular uh, immunity is, is extremely fast. And your, your onset of addiction is extremely quick. You, you go into compulsive behavior extremely fast. It starts to compromise your, you know, your willpower. So you're arguing with yourself, trying to you know, determine to get there, how you're going to get back to your drug. It's a nightmare. And th this is well known. Now, and the poison is so amazingly... Uh, how should I say, it? maybe innocuous, because it, it can be impregnated into paper, into cloth, it can be smuggled into any type of, uh, of uh, environment and then deployed. They, can't, they won't let mail into uh, prisons anymore because they're impregnating it into the paper and then smoking it or using it like bladder. They mm -hmm. cut a little piece of it and put it on their tongue. Um, so we've, we've moved from a material that's been used to addict us and generate billions and billions of dollars a year. We have a $250 billion a year illicit drug supply, and now fentanyl is made up at least 15 to 20% of that. So we're shipping $20, $30 billion a year to the, to the worst possible people, you know, and, and, fuel, and fueling their evil. 
And this whole thing is just taking off this whole monstrous perspective of mass amounts of material being made, sh shoved into our country, uh, people of unknown origin or whatever, uh, whatever forces are, are, are able to infiltrate our country. And we have a, a mass poison available to be used against our public. You know, we're in uh, a very bad situation. I, I, I see that as clearly as you do, Jim. But I, I wanted to just uh, for one second go back to something that Renit was saying, because I tend to sort of get overwhelmed with the gravity of what's going on and sometimes begin to miss the positive. But I want to I want to agree with you and I want to accentuate that a little bit. O over the past three weeks, I think there's been three or four the high level conferences on this uh, topic harm reduction conferences, um, leadership conferences, different types of conferences, uh, webinars. I've never seen uh, this kind of activity before. It seems to be like everyone really is beginning to talk about this now. It's terrible that it had, that it had to get to this point before we began talking about it, but it is no longer like a silent kind of secret thing that's operating under the surface. So I want to agree with you about that, uh, Renee, and I, I also want to, you know, commend all the, the many uh, recovery coaches and medical doctors and ASAM, the different types of treatment organizations, certainly the 12 step groups out there, everybody who's been dealing with this on a, on a daily basis, you know, we're, we're coming together as a, as a, as a culture and um, it, is, it is a very positive thing and we tend to do that as Americans, you know, we, 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 we do, when we're threatened, we, we, we do come together well. You know, Jim, I'd like you to talk a little bit, talking about coming together well and joining together and doing something. You know, I mean, you have a, a movement that you've begun that I think is important, and I'd like you to talk about this a little bit. Families Against Fentanyl. What is Families Against Fentanyl? Well, first of all, what I want to say is, if it weren't for the actions of first responders, people like Ranit, whatever, the administration of Narcan, this would be so amazingly much worse. Yeah. There have been hundreds of thousands of people's lives yeah. saved with Narcan. Yeah. And the first responders, every one of them that you'll talk to, what they do majorly now is run around administrating Narcan. That's one of their major things that they do. Yeah. They're on that every day, every fireman, every every uh, ambulance driver, every policeman. They're all carrying it. They're all administrating this. It, it, that's covering up, you know, a great deal of what of the horror of what's happening. Yeah. So thank God for the first responders. Thank God for all, all of these people that are working, you know, trying to abate this horror that's happening to us. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I take my hat off to them. It's not like any, nobody's doing nothing. Mm -hmm. This is uh, being pursued with the vehemence and uh, loyalty of people that, you know, are putting their their time and their effort and everything into saving lives of, of our fellow citizens moment by moment. Yeah, I know a lot of people who are working a lot, a lot of overtime, you know, exactly yes. right along those lines. What about families uh, against fentanyl, Jim? Mm -hmm. Families Against Fentanyl, we have uh, 30,000 signatories on our, on our petition now. We have um, a nonpartisan group of people that are working to influence the government from a letter to President Biden asking him for an executive order that's been signed by people from uh, John Brennan to Utam Dillon, former head of the DEA and various other luminaries. We're, we're pleading to the president to please execute this as quickly as possible. We're building support in Congress and in the Senate. Mm. Uh, we've had the Commission for Combating Synthetic Opioids and trying to influence those. We've moved towards uh, the Office of Nud, uh, National Drug Control Policy and try to influence Dr. Gupta, who, who has a very good understanding of what's going on, mm. a very uh, strong experience over in West Virginia. And... Um, we're trying to implement the WMD designation so we can do the things that are necessary to stop this. You were talking about cutting off the money. WMD designation gives us the ability to, to stop the bank, the banking, the treasury can, can sanction the money. The, the 
uh, government can hold the other governments accountable. It breaks the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act. It gives us powers that will enable us to intercept uh, wire transactions all over the world and trace them. What, what orient, where they came from, where it's going. They can trace the chemicals. They can find the manufacturing plants. They can react to them and shut them down. Mm. Say that, you know, you have, you have a thousand manufacturing plants. That's way easier than to shut down a thousand manufacturing plants than there is to, to arrest a 400,000 dealers. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, you know, I work in a, in a trauma center. So we give, you know, somebody is bleeding, we give them blood, we need transfusion. That's important. The, the Narcan, the treatment for addiction, that's the blood transfusion. But if we want to stop the bleeding in the first place, we got to cut the source. We have to, uh, and that's so important, cutting the source um, before it even hits um, uh, the United States, because that's just predatory on our population. It, it's it's science. It'll it'll you reduce supply, you raise the price. It's that's going to happen the first thing, and so and so you it becomes scarcer and scarcer and scarcer and scarcer, and you're able to shut this down. But you're able to to seize their dang money, and really uh, that's that's good. That's going to put the the fear of God into them right away. So, and that and that um, isn't that. I mean, just to kind of elaborate. You know, I don't really. I'm not familiar with this level of activity, but but it makes so much sense. Dan Ciccaroni, uh, a researcher at the University of California, um, San Francisco, it, he calls it a supply side shock. Like usually, uh, demand affects you know the supply. In this, it's been a reversal. It's the supply yes. is controlling the demand, and the supply is coming from international crime organizations. So in this case, we need to do something about the supply. But, you know, in your model, what's interesting then, with all this interdiction in wire, you know, and, 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 and freezing people's assets that, and, and cutting off supply, we, we, and I'm sure you've thought about this and talked about this with the people you commiserate with, we have to be ready to deal with the people on the ground who actually have addiction. So if we oh. control the supply, we have to meet them where they are, and we have to supply something that is going to help them to maintain stability while they, you know, regain their, 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 their physical, medical, mental, mental health. That would have to be like a major part of the program. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Treatment, treatment of the addicted, ed, continuous education. Um, I, I don't know of any way to completely stop the demand or or the supply. We can have major effects upon it. Yeah. We can we can possibly control. Uh, one of my greatest fears is having this be deployed by somebody of the likes of Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber, or the fellows that used it uh, did the. Uh, Boston Marathon bombing, or one any of the other insidious terrorists that have uh, come to the United States, this this presents an opportunity that for uh, civil unrest of epic proportions, and we need to get ahead of it. I would say we're already there. I mean, yes, you know, we could have the you know Boston um, bombing or a big event like that, but. This is more subtle. This is more like COVID, right? We've got a little yes. bit of cases, everybody, right? And so oh, we're just kill killing, you know, two and a half people a day in San Diego County mm -hmm. and only a few people here. But 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 collectively, this is way bigger than a Boston marathon. Right. Yes, it's way bigger. And we're paying them to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. They're taking our money out, doing it, killing right. us. And it's right. like a I, I don't need I don't think we need to wait in fear of something like that happen. I need to think we need to open our eyes and realize it's happening in front of our eyes right now. I hear I, you. I agree with you. There, there's that urgency that I love. <laughs> there's that urgency again. And I, I really I really want America to feel exactly uh, that urgency. You know, it, it uh, we need it, the, the statistics last year, 2021, it's one person every five minutes is, is dying of, of overdose. One person every five minutes. The length of this show, you know, what, what, what is it? Uh, one hour. So 
you know, many people have died while, while we were interacting on this show, and that goes on. And it's getting more frequently as we move forward. So I, I, I think that both of you and, and your movement, uh, Jim, uh, Families Against Fentanyl, couldn't be uh, at a more perfect time. Thank you so much for, 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 for seeing the need and for acting on the need. We're going to run a slide. We're going to run a slide as as far as so we can get people in touch with you. What were you going to say? Um, the indictment that the U.S. government did um, put me in a position that was unique. I be I had represented the public. They they went prosecuted the Zangs. The Zangs were set free. They're still in. They're still manufacturing this, according to uh, Fortress Risk Management in uh, Mexico City, um, who I spoke to a private investigative firm. These are puppets of the Chinese government. This is being done with malice to our public. When I read that indictment, and saw that they were making 16 metric tons a month in China and shipping it over here. I said, that's enough to kill everybody in the country every month. What, what the, in the world? So there's no way for me to turn my back on it, knowing what I know of, of physics, science, chemistry, and what potential this is and what it's doing now in real time. We can stop this. This is doable. Mm -hmm. And we're, we've stigma has blinded us. They've turned their backs on us. And now we and we have to reawaken the the politicians who have the ability to do this, their number one duty of the United States government is to protect its citizenry. Hmm. That's its number one duty. And we're being killed with malicious intent for money. I hear you, Jim. I hear you. And I'd like to put in a plug of what the medical community can do. Uh, um, I think, Jim... <laughs> What we're saying is, again, we need to cut the supply off from, from, from the source and hold people um, and nations accountable um, instead of poisoning and killing Americans. Um, and uh, medical community, you know, like I said, we've, we should be at the table with solutions. And one solution um, we have in California, Tyler's Law, SB oh, yeah. 4, um, which would require every hospital in California to include fentanyl in part of the drug screening. Uh, most of America is not doing that. It's simple. You pay 75 cents per reagent and you include it in your drug screen. If you're screening for whatever reason, we're not telling people how to practice medicine. But if you're getting a drug screen and you're checking for cocaine and PCP and meth, it should also include fentanyl. And that's not happening now. And um, I'm hoping that this will pass in California and, and also nationwide. Congratulations on that, uh, Renee. Nice, nice going. I, I read the bill, and it's also, it's a, a really educational piece to read. It's beautiful, and then it's educational, and I think it passed unanimously in, in one chamber of Congress. Yeah, unanimously. It, it passed Senate Health with unanimous bipartisan support in California, which is amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <clears throat> so, Jim. You know, if somebody wants to join uh, Families Against Fentanyl, we're going to put up a slide. They can get in touch with oh, you. What do they do? They fill out an application. What do they do? How do you join? Uh, uh, just sign our petition. It's on, on our website. So okay. Come sign the petition. You're, uh, uh, you can uh, email us. We're open to uh, any help. Um, we're inclusive. We're trying to avert the continuous disaster that's happening. As I said, it's doubled in two years. This is following an epidemiological trend that's just so uh, shocking. It's unbelievable. We can't have it double again. And if it, and believe me, if it weren't for the excellent work of uh, the people on the ground, the first responders, everything else, it, uh, it, it, would, be, it would be totally uh, chaos by now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud um, to have you here in Vermont, to have you both here in Vermont, to be present in Vermont. We'll get this show out as, 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 as widely as we possibly can, and hopefully we'll, we'll gain a little bit more support for uh, families against uh, fentanyl. 
Renate, I, I, I'll get some people to, you know, will be tuning in to High Truths. I certainly truths will be watching drugs it. Drugs and addiction, yeah, conversations that, you know, hopefully move um, an agenda. And also on my website, if anybody listening needs a prescription for naloxone and can't get it for whatever reason, <clears throat> frankly, it should be over the counter. But if not, I put a free prescription on my website. Just download it, use it, um, um, no questions asked. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, you know, for the viewing audience, I mean, you know, how, how lucky are we to have uh, people like this on the show just coming on because they care? You know, this is what it's all about. I read a, an interesting quote by Paul Tillich. He's a, a philosopher, theologian. And his main point in a paper, one of his papers, is you have to have love before help. Help without love becomes a problem. But help after love is effective. And that's the way I see you two. I see you two as really offering love uh, to this particular population. And as a result of that, you're capable of, of helping them and helping us. So thank you for, for contributing as much as you do. And I will look forward to following you and maybe having you on the show. Uh, again, at some point in the future, uh, because you inspire me, and I'm sure you have inspired many of my, uh, my audience. So again, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ed. It's a pleasure yeah. being on. Yeah. Thank you, Renee. You're great, as yeah. you know. Yeah. And thank you, too. And it's an honor to be part of the Families Against Fentanyl team. And Ed, thank you for your show and your passion, uh, as well, bringing solutions to this problem. Thank you. Thank you.